I, I crashed. I woke up and I opened my, my curtains. And this is stunning. I didn't know where I was. I didn't know what state I was in. Apparently I was living in another state. Um, but I'm pretty sure I'm here for Northern Kentucky SCA, and I am um, just excited and grateful to the leadership for bringing me into this opportunity. I want to testify to you guys today. I want to share some of my own testimony as uh, it came to coming into the faith how SCA played a role in that. But I also have a very specific word from the Lord for you all as you all gather to not only hear the vision and the mission of SCA, um, but really begin to lean into and press into what God is doing in this area, what he's desiring to do in this area, and how we can each play a part. Um, so I want to pray before we even begin. The, the word of the Lord says that the kingdom of God is not in talk, but it's in power. And I don't intend to waste my time or yours by giving a compelling talk where we just walk away knowing a little bit more about my own story. I fully pray that the Spirit of God would move in power, that we would encounter him in a unique and fresh way in this time, and that it would compel you forward to uh, go and make disciples. It would compel you into the work that the Lord is carrying out. So let's pray and we will jump in. Y'all didn't know it was going to be a ministry moment up here, but we, uh, we are about to make the most of it. So Heavenly Father, I thank you and I praise you for this day, for this time, for your name, which is the name above all names. You are Alpha and Omega, beginning and end, the one who was and is and is to come. You are holy. Let your name be glorified. Lord, let your kingdom be built. Let your work prevail. Let your glory move in power in this time, in this place, in this city. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the freedom and the privilege to gather. Lord, I pray the blood of Jesus over this space, over this time, over each and every person present, God that you would move to encounter us in a real and rich way, that you would bring your word to life. And I pray that you would take the words from my lips and prophetically translate them to each and every person present. You know the number of hairs on their head. You know the days of their story. You know the plans and purposes that you have for them, God. If you see fit that that aligns with the work you are doing, through FCA in this area, I pray you would move, that we would experience you in such a way that dots would connect, that things would click, and that we would hear from you today. We love you. We praise you. I pray your blessing over this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So it always excites me a great deal to testify and share some of my testimony with relation to FCA because the Fellowship of Christian Athletes actually played a part and was a vehicle for the glory of God and the encounter of God through multiple seasons of my life. I was raised up in the church and I was raised up in a, a wonderful home with God-fearing parents who worked to instill in me what it meant to be a woman of God. But at the same time, I was um, an athlete, I was a soccer player, I was a perfectionist, I was a performer, I, uh, it's how I was wired. It's how many of the young people that this ministry comes across are wired. And it's why they choose athletics as a form or an expression of the gifts or the talents that they have. But it comes with this layer of performance and the desire to work, 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 to continue to be the best and oftentimes that comes gripped around different areas of control. And so that was my story. Uh, knew a lot about God. I should disclaimer, that's very different than knowing God. I knew a lot about the scriptures, about the gospel. I was in church on Sunday and, um, you know, Bible studies here and there. I could have told you a good bit about the things of God, but... 
Knowing a lot about God is very different than knowing God. Working really hard to be a good person is what I thought the extent of uh, the faith kind of meant. And then I, I got my Jesus point. So it was either church on Sunday or like jackpot if there was a funeral or a wedding. Because then, you know, at a different point, we got our Jesus points that week and we could sleep in on Sunday. I was very much in a rhythm of a faith by inheritance. I'm a Christian because my parents are Christian. And I was very much in a rhythm of um, cultural Christianity. I am from Atlanta, so it's the Bible Belt, it's the South. Um, it is normal to call yourself a Christian. I travel all over the country, that dynamic looks very different in different places. Um, and sometimes actually is a greater stronghold and challenge to overcome in areas where it is normal and accepted to say, I am a Christian, dangerous because we can know a lot about God and call ourselves a Christian. And yet then we encounter Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and things start shaking inside of us. Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who do the will of my Father. On that day, they'll say, did we not see what we did, how we performed? We cast demons, we prophesied, we performed miracles. But I will say to them, away from me, I never knew you. So there is a knowing that is so essential to the gospel story, the real gospel encountering us and transforming us. But that knowing and being known comes not just because of uh, parents who went to church, and so I guess I'm also in, it comes from encounter, encountering the spirit of the living God. And this is what takes us from believing about something, even the demons believe and they shudder, to truly knowing him and walking with him. Encounter is the ingredient that changes the trajectory. And I didn't know this growing up. So I went to high school. I sort of made my proclamation of God, watch me work, watch the things I want to do with my life. I wanted a college scholarship and I wanted um, to control how I would do athletically, socially, relationally, right? And this is, um, our schools right now in this area around the country really are filled with young people who want to make something of themselves, who have ideas and thoughts and visions, but they don't know their identity at all, and they don't know how to go about a significant life. And so the proclamation is often, watch me work, and then we start striving, and then we start faking it till we make it, and then we start compromising, and then we change into whoever uh, everybody wants us to be. And it is gripping the young people in this culture, and it gripped me because I didn't know my identity. And so when things didn't go the way that I hoped they would, and I didn't have control like I thought I would, the enemy met me with some very vicious lies in that place that I needed to control something. And that desperation for control in my life turned into eating disorder, turned into self-harm, turned into a very all-consumed, self-centered walk of trying my best to be enough and hating myself when things didn't work out or didn't measure up and trying to earn the favor of others, living to please man, confused constantly, tearing down my own temple, wrecked by this struggle to even know if I was worth much. But I kept many of those things in secret. The world had a big pat on the back. I got the college scholarship. I was struggling viciously with an eating disorder, abusing diet pills, energy pills, but still able to put on that mask and perform on the outside. Got a college scholarship, the world gave a big thumbs up, and people didn't really realize I was drowning and hurting and unsure of who I was and what there was for my life. I went to college, and after my freshman year, I had a great freshman year, scored the 90 yard goal that he mentioned, and we were catapulted onto some national platforms and stages, and it seemed like, um, okay, this must be what it actually means to be a Christian, right? Like, I, I, I'll give God the glory, and I'll look for him 
in all the things, um, and then he gives me the blessing. And so I'm more comfortable with this uh, this style of Christianity, I guess, and um, had this great freshman year, had this skewed perspective still of the faith, uh, but I went home for Christmas break after my freshman year, and one night my dad didn't come home. He had just been, and he was, my biggest fan through and through, and while there were volatile, relational things at times, um, he was my, my dearest friend. And one night uh, during winter break, my dad didn't come home. To make a very long portion of the story short, um, we called his cell phone, it was cut off. We found a love note written beneath the phone at our home. It said, I do love you and had his name signed. We had a voicemail that was my father's voice, but it wasn't really my daddy. It was scared and it was empty and he said he needed to just clear his head that he was driving around and he loved us. Um, and the next morning after falling asleep, confused on what to even pray, mind you, I'd just come off this incredible mountaintop high experience in college and had come out of some of the things I'd been struggling with in high school, was experiencing blessing and, and um, just untouchable and invincible, and now I'm falling asleep confused on what to even pray, what is going on. Our mom had shared there were some financial things that came to the surface, but otherwise we didn't really have much concept of what was going on. And I woke up the next morning to my mom screaming, a sheet of paper just crackling in her hand from uh, the computer, get in the car, get in the car, grab your shoes, grab your things. We pile in the car, we start speeding around town to any place my dad might have been. And Finally, after begging her, she shoved this sheet of paper into the back seat where I was sitting and then said, here, read this and then please help me. And I ironed out this printer paper and it was an email that had been printed off that was a suicide letter from my dad. Mm. It summarized his life in four little paragraphs. And we ended up at his office with police officers and chaos and commotion and so much noise. And I'll never forget when everything went silent and three officers walked to the door and they said, ma'am, my mom who was next to my sister and myself, said, we found your husband. We thought, thank you, Jesus. I don't know what's going on. I can't wrap my head around how and who to even be in this type of chaos. I don't understand how all of this is going to work, but I've, I've experienced you in the good places, and so I need you to come through. And they cleared their throats, and then I'm sorry, let us clarify, they said, um, we found your husband's remains. So it was January 3rd, 2009, that my dad put a gun to his heart and pulled the trigger. It was January 3rd, 2009, that I took off running as far and as fast as I could from God. I don't believe that you're real. I don't believe that you're good. I don't believe that you're holy. If you are real, then you're not a good God. If you were a good God, you wouldn't let such disaster happen. And I say this to say we have to understand this is the mindset of many of the young people in the area around us who are dealing with very real things at home. We've spent a lot of time in Christendom and in the church talking about the fluffy, feel-good, uh, light, Stuff that we leave on an emotional high. But the reality is that most people in our area are not living life running on an emotional high. Maybe we could testify, even in this room right now, there are very real things from identity issues to eating disorder to self-harm to suicide to divorce to depression to anxiety, real things at war for the children and for the young people in our community, at war for many adults in our community. But for me, I was a young person, overwhelmed. And I hadn't heard or encountered anyone that came with a message that this gospel story, this power of the living God could reach and minister to all of those spaces. And so I began to struggle with depression, anxiety, promiscuity, oh my goodness. Did any sin-sized piece seek it to try to fill the God-sized hole in my heart? I gave piece after piece after piece of myself away in hopes that someone would give me their heart. 
anything to numb the pain, I had to look at my dad's body on a morgue table, table and wonder how this tiny hole had taken down a man the size of Samson. And I was completely broken. I felt anger and resentment. There was a spirit of suicide even that, that warred for my own heart and life. I would hear voices that I too was going to kill myself even if I didn't want to. It was bound to happen. It was going to happen by my own hand. If my father had done it, I would do it. The enemy was at war for my soul. And I remember in high school, when I had been struggling in these different ways. Lesser ways, I would say, really, than ultimately what I was struggling with as a young adult. But there'd been these people. There'd always been these few coaches, Coach Morris and Coach Cagle. I can say them by name. I still love them and have a relationship with them now. These coaches and these young people that seemed to see me beyond the athlete. They seemed to care about the deeper parts of me and love me differently and speak to me differently and I didn't really receive it at that time <laughs> but it was planting seeds that I still see the harvest of today because those coaches and these athletes that would gather in this FCA group were different in the way they loved me and saw me was different and it came back to my mind because in college in this moment I remember standing in the Alabama church where my dad's funeral was taking place and the whole back wall was lined by these people from LSU that I hadn't actually really ever talked to or given much mind to and it was these FCA people. And then I went back to campus and I'm depressed, I'm overwhelmed, I'm promiscuous, I'm acting out, I'm wearing a mask and faking fine because I'm the sports star on campus, right? But inside I'm just... Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, but there were these FCA people that kept showing up, that kept coming into my story, that kept seeing me beyond the mask that most people bought into and believed and cared about the most as this athlete, but kept asking me deeper questions, kept meeting me in the training room spaces, or even some of the girls were on my team. And I remember, wait, these are the same people, these FCA people, that seemed different to me in high school. And now I'm back here and I'm not quite ready to receive it. I'll be completely honest with you. But these same people are different and present and seeing me and caring about me beyond just athletic things. And so again, seeds were planted, seeds were sown. About a full year passed and I was headed back from Baton Rouge to Atlanta. I was in a terrible place, again, suicidal ideations myself, depressed, overwhelmed, resentful, angry. Really the cry of my heart was, God, if you're so real, do something. Do something, because I'm hearing all these people say, you're good, and you're a healer, and you're a redeemer, but I, I don't even know if I believe any of these things. If you're so real, reveal yourself to me or else end everything because this life really isn't worth living in this degree of pain that I was navigating at the time. And I was headed home from Baton Rouge to Atlanta and it was 1.30 in the morning because I'd been stuck in traffic and I'm watching the lines tick by as I drive. I have my hookup on lined up for when I get home to Georgia. I'm full of anger, full of hatred, full of resentment, I'm tired of faking fine, always wearing these masks, you could win Academy Awards for what great actors and actresses you are. And I'm at this place of just my lowest, and the next thing I knew, my car was in the center median and my wheel was just cranking and jerking. I was like, what is going on, snap out of it. I tried to pull my vehicle back onto the interstate. I, I shot straight across, hit an embankment, flipped my Jeep several times and landed upside down in a ravine at 1.30 in the morning, completely alone, and now physically broken. I'd broken a vertebrae in my neck, damaged ribs, lungs, liver, jaw, and I was hanging upside down in this Jeep, and people hear the story, and they think, good grief, another piece 
of adversity that I was hanging upside down in this Jeep. And when I tell you in that place of brokenness, mind you, I'd been emotionally broken, mentally broken before. Now I was at the greatest point of physical brokenness, hanging upside down in this Jeep. The spirit of the living God entered in to that wreckage in a way I tell this, I testify regularly and every time I still get goosebumps thinking about the weight and the power and the move of majesty that came into that wreckage and completely overwhelmed me. You see, the cry of my heart had been, God, if you're so real, do something. And God's answer, he doesn't have to sideline us on the interstate. He will if he needs to. He's willing to do anything in order to save our story and save our eternal story. But the most profound thing that happened in that moment, even though there was the chaos of wreckage, was that I encountered the still small voice. It was like a whisper that said my name to me. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm 4610. And the spirit of the Lord overwhelmed me. And I hung upside down in this wreckage, in this moment of holy encounter. And it was like we will be the greatest ones to talk ourselves out of the grace and glory of God. Because everything in my mind was like, you've got the wrong one. I'm the promiscuous one. I'm the one who's hurt myself. I've been the hypocrite. I've said I was a Christian and I've blasphemed. I've been sexually promiscuous. I've been drinking. I've been partying. Surely you have the wrong one. But in this place of encounter, it was like the gospel came into revelation to me that he did not take the cross just for the forgiveness of our sins. He had to take the cross because of my sins. Because of your sins. And yet on that cross he stayed. He could have come down. But he stayed. Gave his life. Defeated death. Was resurrected. That I might know that resurrection story in my own life as well. That I might receive of his mercy, his forgiveness, and his grace. And come to life to life in the spirit and be redeemed. This is the power of encounter. This is the power when we see the cross and it matters to us because it was for us. This is the power of what Jesus wants to do in each and every person's life, young and old, to encounter them just as they are, to open their eyes, to transform their heart, to heal them, to deliver them, to save them. And it's what he did with me in that wreckage place. I had the choice to choose. It was so clear. And all of this happened in a moment, mind you. But the choice became very clear in light of this sustaining and saving love. What would I choose? I chose that day whom I would serve. And everything changed. I had to go back to school a couple weeks later. I had some recovery time. And I remember going back and kind of um, going back into the friend groups that I had been with before. It's all I knew. Like going back into my rhythms and and being drawn right back into the same sin. And something was so different in that moment. When those sins, when I committed those sins, when I found myself in those environments, there was something that was different. It wasn't a condemnation and shame. There was a conviction of, hey, you know there's more than this. Remember our moment of encounter. Come away with me. Come out of these things. So I'm like, I don't know what's happening. I have no language for this. I had grown up in the church my whole life and didn't know what sanctification was, didn't know what repentance was, didn't know what it truly meant to live in holiness. But the moment of encounter had transformed everything, and it was always wooing me to his heart. So I had to step away from every friend. You'll, you'll learn real quickly who your acquaintances are and who your friends are when you'll no longer serve the sin in someone. And there's no more relationship. God was wooing me to his heart. And I stepped away from so many people 
and so many circumstances. But then there came the SBA people. <laughs> you see, we get so afraid sometimes that to truly live holy, to hunger and thirst for righteousness, to walk in step with him, that we're going to be a lone wolf and doing this all on our own. And it's hard. It's hard for young people to, to seek him above all, knowing that means some things have to go. But he's so faithful. He's so faithful to bring, to restore, to renew. And he began to restore relationships and restore connections through these SCA people. And suddenly I realized, wait, there's way more of you guys than I even thought. And I actually like y'all more than I liked the people I was hanging with previously. We saw and began to see God do some incredible things through the ministry of FCA as it carried forth the gospel message message of Jesus. First off, it restored relationship and friendship in my own life. We also began to see revival on LSU's campus as the people of God came together and prayed. I was surrounded suddenly by a community that was hungering for the same things I was hungering for. We would worship together. We would pray together. Weekly, we would hear messages. And what was so beautiful is it wasn't just us being talked to by um, adults all the time. We were actually empowered and equipped. It was really a student-run ministry in so many ways because they couldn't handle the numbers. I think FCA on LSU's campus was about five people a few years before I came to know Christ. And by the time I finished, we were maxing out the stadium auditorium thing with 300 plus people and two adults leading it. And students activated. Students seeing, wow, not only are there others like me who are hungering for these things, but and the word of God says there are gifts knit into me that I can contribute. We started to see revival on LSU's campus. Uh, man, testimony after testimony. Uh, Kate was a friend of mine who was um, a Messianic Jew. She had come to know Jesus, and uh, she started to move in power on the campus. She was an athletic trainer, but she encountered him and found community in that way. Uh, people were set free. People were coming into salvation. She was uh, now continues to serve even ministerially traveling the world with World Break. Uh, my best friend Molly came. She uh, had just come to know Jesus when she transferred, realized she was pregnant from sin before in her life. And um, man, fought in this new faith. The people of FCA came around her, believed for her, prayed over her. She chose to keep that life. She now serves with FCA full time. She's married with four kids, about to adopt uh, another son. I mean, it's the most powerful testimonies. We saw uh, football players who at one moment, I remember watching come into the pool area we were with a uh, fifth in one hand and a black and mild in the other, laughing and joking about how one had beaten up his girlfriend. And this was the entertainment of the moment. And fast forward a few months, there are photos of them being baptized and coming into the fullness of faith, their lives transformed. And so we saw revival on LSU's campus through the ministry of FCA. And this was because the ministry leveraged what most people see as the identity over these young people of athletes. It's not their identity. Sorry if that hit hard in a sports group. But the idolatry of sport even bends a knee to the identity of son or daughter of the Most High God. And we saw, we just saw them as athletes. They were coming into encounter with their true identity, leveraging their sport, leveraging their platform, leveraging their position for the glory of God, using sport, not as their identifier, but as their open door to see the gospel go forward. And we were seeing them bring the good news of the gospel and the power of God into their team, into their relationships. We saw so many beautiful things, and I continue to travel the country and see this take shape. FCA has found an open door, an entrance point to bring the gospel through sport, to encounter the coaches, to encounter the players, so that the true work of kingdom building will prevail, so that the true work of kingdom building and encounter can even take place. I love in the scriptures when we see um, 
Mary Magdalene encountered Jesus at the tomb. In John 20, it's so interesting to me because Mary is distraught. She's seen a lot of things come to pass that she didn't expect to see. I mean, this is a woman who's walked with Jesus, lived with Jesus, essentially a disciple of Jesus, knows what he looks like, has heard his voice, and yet she's seen a lot of circumstances take place that was not what any of them were expecting. There are a lot of people, a lot of young people, who are seeing a lot in our world right now. They're seeing circumstances set before them in their friendships, in their families, in their relationships, in our nation, over the earth. They're seeing a lot of things that don't look like they are as they should be, right? And circumstances and what we see before our eyes have the power to overwhelm and consume us. And Mary's just seen the death and the crucifixion of Jesus, and she's overwhelmed. And it says she goes to the tomb. And this is what's so interesting to me. She's weeping at the tomb. She sees two angels, and they ask, Woman, why are you weeping? She says to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around, and she saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. So this is a woman who's been with Jesus for many years, and she's seeing him again before her eyes, but she doesn't recognize him. It says then that Jesus spoke to her, so then she's also hearing his voice, but she does not recognize it. She thinks that he is the gardener. So she's seeing Jesus, and she's hearing Jesus, but she is not able to recognize Jesus. It is not until Jesus says, Mary, he speaks her name. It is a moment of personalized encounter that suddenly the eyes of her heart are enlightened, as the word of God says. Her ears become open to hear, and she is able to perceive the resurrected Jesus. He calls her by name, and she says, Rabbi, and she runs to him. And Jesus' instruction to her then is, do not cling to me. For I have not yet ascended to the Father, but go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to the Father, to your Father, to my God, and your God. It says, and Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and he has said these things to her. This is the power of encountering the spirit of the living God. And this is why we have to have boots on the ground and people moving on mission for others to encounter him. Because we can know a lot about God. We can have heard a lot about him. We can have read a lot about him. Maybe we've seen the church culture or in our family growing up. Mary knew Jesus in that capacity. But to truly be activated by the risen Lord, the power of the resurrected Jesus, it comes in a moment of encounter where he calls us out by name where we come alive to say, whoa, you're bigger than I thought you were. You have a new identity that you've spoken over me. In this moment of encounter, Jesus says, hey, don't cling here, go and tell. He sends Mary, go and tell, go and tell. This is how the good news moves forward when we encounter him and we go and tell. And for encounter to take place, there has to be um, <laughs> Interaction. There has to be relationship, right? These are the encounters that God is desiring take place through us as it is our mandate to go and tell, to proclaim the good news, to see captives set free, to bring the gospel, to share love and to move in power. This is our assignment. And I think a lot of the times we resolve to say, well, I will just pray about um, that and that that would take place. And God's like, that's great. Our, our prayers are powerful. But also I need those who will rise up and move prayers into action. See, the reflection of what we believe is how we act and move. It is what we do. It is where our resources flow. It is how we pray. It is who we serve.
character or the reflection of what you truly believe, you can gauge by your finances, where your time is spent, where your prayers are directed, and um, how deeply you love. This is what reflects if we truly believe that gospel story that this work is the most important work, that encounter does bring breakthrough and changes things completely. And this is the call for the church. It is in Matthew 9, 35, it says, Jesus went through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, for they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out the labors into his harvest. When I think of Jesus looking around at the young people, school-aged people, elementary, middle, high school, college, young adults, even grown adults, I believe his heart is moved to a fiery compassion because so many are like sheep without a shepherd. They're assaulted on every side by porn, by horrible influences, by music that is shaking their minds and hearts, by things set before them and said to be normal on TV, in movies. From every place the enemy can enter, he is doing just that into the young people. They're depressed, they're anxious, they're suicidal, they're overwhelmed. They don't even always have safe homes to come to to hear their true identity spoken over them. I believe that the spirit of the living God is looking over the young people of this town, of this community, of this area, and his heart is stirred to compassion because he sees them afflicted like sheep without a shepherd, but he doesn't come without answer. He says, listen to my disciples, to all those with ears to hear. You are the answer. Me working through you is the answer. The fields are ripe for harvest but the workers are few. Let it not be so. In this area, let it not be so. Would our funds and our finances move to support the kingdom work? Would our hands and our feet move to support the kingdom work? Would our prayers move in great petition to support the kingdom work? This is how we will know we are his disciples, by the way that we love. And by the way that we respond when we see young people overwhelmed, harassed and helpless by life circumstances, by many things that have happened to them, by the influences of the culture around them. And we say today it changes because the Great Commission says that he has given all authority by his name to us to carry out the mandate, to reign and rule in righteousness, to see kingdom come. This is our invitation, and I can testify that it will change a life completely because of the seeds that were sown in middle school, because of the seeds that were sown in high school, because of the seeds that were sown in college. All those times I wasn't yet ready to receive until the Spirit of God moved in encounter and suddenly all those seeds burst forth harvest. Relationship, community, revival took place as a result. And this is the labor that the Fellowship of Christian Athletes is seeking to do in the campuses around.